Welcome to the Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner, and my guest today is Dr. Karina Marshall Gobel. Welcome, Karina. Hi, thank you for having me. So this is kind of a, this is a, a new interview with you, but it's a follow up on a topic that's of interest to me, which is space medicine. And I've had uh, some other experts on this show to talk about the safety and health consequences of traveling in space. And outer space appears to be getting uh, closer and closer. Today is August 16th, and we're just on the heels of uh, two recent, right? Short, but far <laughs> trips uh, into space by uh, just regular old uh, wealthy, but normal citizens, <laughs> uh, not, not astronauts. And uh, so, you know, something that we don't talk about too much is, well, how safe is it? to travel in space. I mean, everybody thinks, well, the, the rocket could blow up and unfortunately that has happened and that's always a concern and you're gonna be floating around. That seems inconvenient. Um, a lot of people have heard, well, if you're in space for a long time, your muscles kind of atrophy because there's no, but there's a lot more to it than that, right? Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your background and what's your uh, angle on the health aspects of long duration space travel? So um, I have a, a master's in space studies and a PhD in physiology. So I kind of took those two and put them together and I've been an aerospace physiology researcher uh, for about 10 years now at various government institutions and academic institutions, including Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, uh, the German Space Agency, the DLR, um, and I'm currently a senior scientist with KVR at NASA's Johnson Space Center in the Cardiovascular and Vision Laboratory. Um, my main research focuses on the spaceflight-associated neuroocular syndrome, what we call SANS. Um, so really looking at some of the ocular and brain structural changes that we see during spaceflight and also developing um, countermeasures and different technologies to try to prevent some of these um, physiological changes. So tell us... Uh, tell us briefly, uh, what is SANS? So SANS, the spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome, it affects about two thirds of astronauts during uh, long duration missions. So about the standard four to six month mission to the International Space Station. Um, it's currently diagnosed if you meet one of four criteria, um, which are the presence of choroidal or retinal folds, um, a refractive error shift of 0.75 diopters or higher, um, optic disc edema or globe flattening. And optic disc edema is uh, by far our most prevalent finding um, and also quite concerning. And it's really um, the main finding that led us to discover SANS in the first place. Um, and you know, SANS is still relatively new. It was really the first publication that came out was about 10 years ago. Uh, but what I find so interesting is even within the last 10 years, we have found um, a variety of new health challenges and changes that occur in the human body. So I, I think it goes to show that we're really at the tip of the iceberg and we really have so much still to learn about the human body and how it adapts to space flight. Um, so some of those changes, for example, are we've seen a lot of brain structural changes. Um, and we also discovered the first thrombosis or blood clot, uh, venous thrombosis during space flight. Um, so both of those, I think, show that, you know, we don't know everything about how the human body adapts to space flight, but uh, we're doing our best to learn about it now so that we can make sure that we are prepared when we finally go to Mars. When I first encountered uh, SANS, I was reading a paper and I think the tip off was, you know, the astronauts uh, by their nature are incredibly healthy, right? I mean, you don't get to be an astronaut if you have a lot of chronic illness. I mean, these, these people are as healthy as human beings get. And a lot of them are like between 35 and 45 years old. They're not, they're not young test pilots anymore, you know, like 20 years old. A lot of them are, you know, mature human beings. And I think some of them ended up needing reading glasses when they're in the space station. It's like, well, gee, I didn't need reading glasses before, and now I do. Like, well, what's up? You know, and uh, you can't just go to the optometrist, right? When you're uh, six months into, you know, the space station. 
So when they started looking at that, it's like, whoa, your eyeball actually changed shape. That's what happens due to prolonged weightlessness. And, uh, you know, that doesn't really sound like a good thing. And you mentioned brain changes. You know, our, our brains have evolved over uh, millions, if not billions of years, right, to do what they do in a gravity scenario, right? I mean, we all grow up with, with gravity. You pick something up and you drop it, it falls every single time. We all, we all agree on that. And the, and the body has responded to that. But if you're weightless, the, all of a sudden the rules change. And that happens quite quite abruptly, right? <laughs> you know, one minute you're yeah. in gravity and about five minutes later, you're floating around in uh, space and, that, and then you're stuck there. So I can, I, I think, as you point out, there's, there's a, a lot of depth to this as to how it may affect human physiology. Well, tell me a little bit about countermeasures. That sounds pretty interesting. So we, we can see these things are happening. We're going to go to Mars anyway, right? Because we're a stubborn kind of, you know, we're propelled, we're going to explore the universe and we, we hope that we can do it more safely. So what, what can we do to mitigate these uh, dangers? Exactly. I agree. I think it's in our DNA to explore. When you look at human history, um, humans have always pushed the boundaries to explore. So I don't think um, there will be much to stop us. Uh, so you're right when you say, when you look at the physiological changes that occur, some are adaptive. It's your body learning to work in a new environment. And it's it's quite intriguing to see how well the body actually does in those circumstances. But there's also maladaptive changes. And like you said, some occur more abruptly, for example, the neurovestibular changes and feelings of motion sickness um, will happen really quickly right when you enter microgravity. And actually, it gets better also within a few days or weeks. Um, but other changes such as muscle atrophy, bone loss, um, changes, structural changes in the brain and the eye, those occur over months um, and years. So, you know, a, a mission to Mars will take round trip about three years. So I think there will be other changes that we haven't thought of now. And it's all about how do you be prepared? Um, but also how do you counteract the changes that you know about these eye changes, the muscle changes. So countermeasures is a huge par part of our portfolio um, that we do, because even if we don't fully understand the mechanisms uh, that underlie the neural ocular changes, for example, um, we still are trying to develop countermeasures to prevent them because we're an operational organization here at NASA. So we have to try to <laughs> um, prevent those changes, even if we don't fully understand them. So some of the uh, countermeasures that we're currently looking at um, have to do with trying to reverse the headward fluid shift. So when you go into space, you don't have gravity pulling that blood and those fluids to your lower body like you do if you're sitting or standing upright and you have gravity pulling um, that blood volume to your legs. You don't have that anymore. And that blood uh, equally distributes across your body. And we call that a relative headward fluid shift. So all of a sudden you have a lot more fluid in your upper body um, and um, possibly an increase in intracranial pressure. We haven't been able to measure it yet in space, um, but we, we do see the, um, the venous system have a lot more blood in the upper body. So what we're really trying to do is counteract that headward fluid shift because it's hypothesized that headward fluid shift um, underlies a lot of these neuroocular changes and cardiovascular changes as well. So we're looking at, uh, for example, lower body negative pressure, uh, which is a device they, uh, we, the, the funny name for them is vacuum pants. Um, so you put them on your lower body and you basically connect it to a vacuum and you decrease the pressure in these pants. They're hard. Um, and what it will do is it will bring that blood back to your lower body um, and away from your head and from your upper body. Um, you can't turn it on too high because you would risk uh, um, syncope, for example. Um, so that is one device that we're actively investigating. Um, another one much simpler are thigh cuffs, um, which are basically similar to a blood pressure cuff. You put them on your upper thighs, you inflate them, and you try to keep that venous blood volume down in your lower limbs. Um, and a third countermeasure that we're actively looking at is artificial gravity via centrifugation. And this one, um, is frequently seen in sci-fi and in movies. Um, it's, a, it's a way that um, producers can say that, you know, our astronauts are able to walk around in the movie on the spaceship because they have artificial gravity, right? It's um, a funny way to do it in the movies, but it's actually something we're looking at. If you spin people on a centrifuge, 
Um, the centrifugal force is um, sensed as a gravitational force. Um, so you're pushed towards the outside of that centrifuge. It brings the blood down to your legs um, and away from your head. Um, the problem is it's very complex, <laughs> technically complex. And to put something like that on a spacecraft, um, it'll take a lot of engineering work because you can't have something that's going to vibrate the ship at all. So these are all different countermeasures that we're looking at. A lot of them seem like sci-fi, but we're actually working on them. Well, that's great. You know, uh, if to, to, to illustrate what we're talking about, if you, if you go look at NASA videos, you know, the astronauts are floating around on the space station. Hi, mom. You know, look at their faces and you see that they, they all have this uh, puffy uh, face look. And, uh, you know, these are guys that are not puffy in real life. And uh, it's because in the space station, water that would normally be in their ankles has kind of come up and evenly distributed, as you said, in their body. And a lot of it ends up uh, in the head where it doesn't really belong. Uh, I love your idea of the negative pressure. I think, uh, I think jet pilots use something opposite, right? Don't they use something to increase the pressure in their legs so that when they're zooming around and uh, they're experiencing G-forces so that the, the blood still gets to the head, right? Where they want it to go so they don't black out. And this is kind of the, uh, you know, you turn the dial the other way. <laughs> exactly. Everything uh, go down. That actually sounds, uh, makes sense to me. I, I like that. And of course, artificial gravity, I read somewhere that in order to get something spinning and produce the gravity, you know, like in the movies, it's got to be like two miles, you know, long or it's you can't just, you know, spin the, the space shuttle and, and make it work. It doesn't that that doesn't happen uh, that way. Right. Yeah, there's two ways you could do artificial gravity. You can have a very large radius like you're talking about where you spin the whole thing. That would be much more comfortable. Um, but much more challenging. But you can also put a very short arm human centrifuge onto, um, for example, you could put one on the space station that is a meter and a half radius um, or, or smaller. Um, the problem with that though, is that it, because it's such a small radius, you'll have a gravitational gradient where a much higher G load at your feet and lower at your head. Um, and there can be uh, Coriolis effects on your vestibular system. Um, so, it's, it's absolutely challenging, but you can make a small uh, centrifuge that could go inside of a spacecraft. Cool, you know, well, I, I was gonna throw away my ticket to Mars when I started reading about all these uh, health effects, but I, I think I'm gonna go find it because uh, it sounds like <laughs> there, these countermeasures may actually uh, work and uh, it'll be uh, you know, a pleasant and scenic uh, journey. Um, bring lots of tapes, I guess. It's a it's a long, yeah. no Wi-Fi out there. No Wi-Fi, um, a bit of a time delay in communication with Earth as well. The farther you get, when you're actually on Mars, depending on the orbit, um, your time delay is anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes uh, for a one-way communication. So you have to remember too, if you have an emergency when you're on Mars, if you say mayday, mayday, Houston's not gonna hear that for 15 to 30 minutes. And then by the time they reply, you know, you're 45 minutes to an hour into your emergency. So um, it's really going to be about training the, that crew to be autonomous and deal with emergencies as they pop up. Um, right now on the space station, it's uh, essentially real-time communication. So we can remote guide them into doing these um, ocular examinations on themselves, doing an ultrasound on themselves, um, which is fantastic for science because we can be there, essentially be there in real time and help them with these measurements um, but that won't be the case on Mars. It'll be a bit more challenging. Yeah, I was very impressed. I had the privilege of uh, visiting uh, Mission Control and uh, one of NASA's physicians, uh, William Tarver, took me in the back room and he showed me that they communicate, you know, every second with the astronauts. Somebody gets a headache up there. NASA knows about it, you know, right away and uh, deals with it. But on a trip to Mars, I guess uh, you're really going to be... Uh, pretty much on, on your own. You're gonna to have to be uh, self-sufficient. Yep, it'll be a whole new beast. Well, Karina, this has been a, a great discussion. I wanna thank you for bringing us up to date on what's happening with uh, space health. And I expect uh, more, more updates as the launch to Mars uh, gets closer. Do, do we have a date? Does NASA have sort of a penciled in date when that's gonna happen or is it still just kind of, well, soon? Well, I would say it's, 
There's not a date in the future. Right now we're focusing on going back to the moon, uh, which will be our primary test bed to, to test these capabilities that we want to bring to Mars. Um, of course, it's much better to test new capabilities when you're relatively close to Earth versus testing something for the first time 140 million miles away. So right now we're focusing on going back to the moon and I look forward to going to Mars after that. Fantastic. Well, I hope we can talk again soon. Thanks very much for joining me on The Art of Medicine. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This program is hosted, edited, and produced by Andrew Wilner, MD, FACP, FAAN. Guests receive no financial compensation for their appearance on The Art of Medicine. Andrew Wilner, MD, is Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Memphis, Tennessee. Views, thoughts, and opinions expressed on this program belong solely to Dr. Wilner and his guests and not necessarily to their employers, organizations, or other group or individual. While this program intends to be informative, it is meant for entertainment purposes only. The Art of Medicine does not offer professional financial, legal, or medical advice. Dr. Wilner and his guests assume no responsibility or liability for any damages, financial or otherwise, that arise in connection with consuming this program's content. Thanks for watching. For more episodes of The Art of Medicine, please subscribe. www.andrewwilner.com